Good evening, everyone. We are so pleased that you could join us for the discussion on the future of pain. My name is Dr. Rachel Bosma, and I am situated in the Faculty of Dentistry at the University of Toronto. And I'm one of the co-directors of the University of Toronto Center for the Study of Pain, or the UTCSP as we call it. My research program is embedded in the, the Toronto Academic Pain Medicine Institute, which is at Women's College Hospital. That's where I work within a clinical setting. I'm interested in evaluating current models of care uh, and clinical programming in order to inform clinical decision-making and health system delivery. I work with a diverse uh, team to trial innovative solutions in healthcare interventions with a focus on chronic pain. Hello, my name is Rob Bonin. I am also a co-director of the University of Toronto Center for the Study of Pain. I'm in the Leslie Dan Faculty of Pharmacy. My team is developing new approaches to study sensory pathways, particularly related to pain. We're also working to identify potential drug targets that aim to address the root source of pain and help to pave the way for the development of new treatments that are more effective for chronic pain. Together, Rachel and I will be your host and moderator this evening. Welcome. All right, before we begin, I wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, this has been the traditional lands of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are so grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. This webinar is offered in collaboration with the UTCSP which is a dedicated center at the University of Toronto involving the faculties of dentistry, medicine, nursing, and pharmacy, who are all working together to understand the mechanisms of pain and how we can treat it better. The Center for the Study of Pain has a focus on training the next generation, and that's who we're going to meet tonight, the future of pain scientists, clinicians, and educators. So tonight we have the opportunity to hear from four students one from each of those faculties, so dentistry, pharmacy, nursing, and medicine. They will each share the exciting work that they are doing in advancing our knowledge of pain. And so now I'd like to take a moment to introduce our speakers this evening. From the Faculty of Dentistry, we have Georgia Hadges. Georgia's research is focused on understanding how pain impacts cognition with the goal of reducing impact and improving patients' life. Welcome, Georgia. We also have with us Lauren Cadell. Lauren will start her PhD in the Leslie Dan Faculty of Pharmacy this fall. Lauren's research is focused on exploring pain and medication management among adults with spinal cord injury. We also have with us Franklin Kurosby. Franklin is a PhD student from the Lawrence Bloomberg Faculty of Nursing. Franklin's research focuses on the multidimensional experience of pain in adults with advanced liver disease. The overall aim of his research is to examine pain from a multi-dimensional perspective for patients with advanced liver disease. And last but not least, we have with us Prab Ajawa. Prab is a master's student in the Temerty Faculty of Medicine. His research is focused on investigating the relationship between medical cannabis use and inflammatory cytokines and chemokines among adults living with chronic pain. Our student presenters met last week and pre-recorded their presentations. We will share them one at a time and then come back later for questions with each speaker. This will be followed by a roundtable discussion. Laura, we're excited to hear more about your research. Hi everyone, my name is Lauren Cadell and I'm currently working as a research coordinator with Dr. Sarah Gilsher at the Leslie Dan Faculty of Pharmacy. So I'll just give you a little bit of a background about myself. So I did my Bachelor of Science at Bowling Green State University, which I finished in 2016. And then I continued on to do my Master's in Pharmaceutical Science at the University of Toronto, which I finished in 2019. And I've just been working as a research coordinator at the Leslie Dan Faculty of Pharmacy, as well as at the Institute for Better Health at Trillium Health Partners since then. I plan to start my PhD in the Leslie Dan Faculty of Pharmacy in the fall. As a part of Dr. Gilsher's lab, our main focus is on improving the physical, social, and cognitive health of persons with multimorbidity, disability, and frailty so they can live their best possible lives. Right now, the major topic areas of our research projects are medication management, 
care transitions, and self-management, with pain and pain management really being addressed in all of those areas. For today, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about my master's research that was focused on exploring pain and medication management among adults with spinal cord injury. And just to note that everything I discuss from now until the next step slides is published. I'm gonna provide a little bit of background just to give this research some context. Spinal cord injuries are caused by damage to the spinal cord, which can be due to a traumatic injury like a car accident or a non-traumatic cause like cancer. Following a spinal cord injury, individuals often experience a significant number of secondary complications and multimorbidities, such as pain, spasticity, depression, and urinary and bowel complications, just to name a few. When looking more specifically at pain, approximately 60% of persons with spinal cord injury experience chronic pain. Due to the high prevalence of secondary complications and multimorbidity that occur post-injury, there's also a high prevalence of the use of multiple medications, which is often referred to as polypharmacy. This can be problematic because many of these medications are also considered high-risk medications, such as opioids for treating chronic pain. When looking more deeply at opioid use, we found that between 55 and 60% of people with spinal cord injury are prescribed an opioid in their first year post-injury, and this aligns with the percent of people who experience chronic pain. Risk factors for opioid use are listed on this slide with some differences between traumatic and non-traumatic injuries. But prior opioid use and having other comorbidities were the same, regardless of injury type. Opioid use can be concerning for persons with spinal cord injury because side effects can further exacerbate secondary complications that are already experienced by this population, such as constipation and respiratory issues. This brings me to the research objectives for this project. For today's presentation, I'm just gonna focus on the last one listed here, which was to explore the experiences of persons with spinal cord injury with medication management. I conducted a descriptive qualitative study where I did telephone interviews with 19 persons with spinal cord injury. The interviews were recorded and transcribed and I analyzed them thematically. Based on the analysis of the interviews, I identified three main themes related to experiences with medications. The first was the disruptive nature of medications, which included wanting to avoid taking medications, but having no other options, varying experiences with the effectiveness of medications, and concerns with the long-term safety. The second was the fear of negative outcomes which included the fear of experiencing secondary complications when decreasing medication doses, and the fear of medication side effects when increasing doses or starting new medications. The last theme was the critical role of self-management, and this included persons with spinal cord injury playing an active role in medication adjustments and strategies for medication taking. I have two quotes here that I'm gonna share, which highlight the complexities of trying to navigate pain and medication use post-injury. The first is from an individual with a traumatic spinal cord injury who had stopped taking a medication because of the side effects he was experiencing as he kept falling asleep during his physical therapy. But he ended up having such bad neurogenic pain that he had to go back on the medication. So he explained, I had neurogenic pain that was absolutely indescribable and continued to say, I'm afraid to go off it, the medication, because I couldn't stand the pain. The second quote here is from another participant with traumatic spinal cord injury, who highlighted how she self-managed her medication adjustments without help from a healthcare provider. She explained, I think that when you're able to decrease down to the level where you're just sort of are getting enough to cover off the pain and not enough that you're groggy is an art form rather than something that doctors can do for you. You have to manage your own self. So when looking at the key takeaways from this research, I identified that managing pain and medication use post-injury is extremely complex, and additional supports are needed to help guide individuals through this process. 
The second is alternative methods for pain management should be considered, such as physical therapy and acupuncture, depending on individuals' preferences, concerns, and beliefs. And lastly, providers should engage in ongoing conversations about pain management and medications. As we saw that perceptions and desires to take medications often changed over time, depending on medication effectiveness and side effects that were experienced. So it's important for providers to be aware of these changes. So this leads me to the next steps, both for me personally and for this research. So as I mentioned earlier, I'm planning to pursue my PhD at the Leslie Dan Faculty of Pharmacy beginning this year. And my project would involve co-designing, testing, and evaluating a toolkit intervention for medication self-management for persons with spinal cord injury. This would be a three-phased mixed methods project. The first phase would use concept mapping with persons with spinal cord injury, caregivers, and healthcare providers to co-develop a preliminary toolkit. In the second phase, I would use qualitative interviews to refine the toolkit by assessing the language use, the comprehensibility, the delivery, and the overall design. And lastly, the third phase would be the pilot testing and evaluation portion. And this is where persons with spinal cord injury would interact with the toolkit and then participate in a number of surveys and interviews to better understand the feasibility, acceptability, and appropriateness, as well as several other outcomes, such as medication-related knowledge, self-efficacy, medication-related skills and behaviors, and quality of life. I'm looking forward to the opportunity to build on my master's research and look more deeply into how to improve both pain and medication management for persons with spinal cord injury. I'd just like to thank my supervisor, Dr. Sarah Gilsher, as well as the rest of the members of this team and the funders for supporting this work. If you're interested in any of our other projects or for more information on this research, I've listed some resources on this slide. Glad I was able to share some of our research with you today. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us, Lauren. It was a very interesting talk. Um, so I'd like to just start off this round of questions, uh, looking, I guess, at a high level, that you mentioned that one of the themes of your work that you uncovered is the critical role of self-management. I'd like to just ask, could you dive into this a little bit more? What did the individuals that you interviewed describe when they talked about self-management? Yeah, of course. So two main areas of self-management were really discussed. Um, the first was in terms of self-managing medication adjustments. And then the self second was in terms of just self-managing daily medication use. So with medication adjustments, um, participants talked about reaching out to healthcare providers to, to initiate the adjustments. And that was often because of experiencing unwanted side effects or potentially because their medications weren't covering or managing their secondary complications to the extent that they desired. Um, so on the other hand, though, some participants talked about doing these adjustments by themselves. So they would increase or decrease doses or just stop taking medications entirely without talking to a healthcare provider. Um, but when looking at this a little bit more deeply, we often saw that this was due to accessibility issues. So um, participants talked about um, the challenges with actually getting to their prescriber, getting into the office, the amount of time it would take. So like, it's just easier if I um, tried to do it, to do it myself instead. And then when looking at just strategies for daily medication use, um, most participants had their own individualized strategy that they found to work for them. And this was often just in terms of problem solving, trial and error. Um, and most commonly, the self-management strategies used by participants were taking their medications and incorporating them into their daily routines. So, for example, taking their medications with breakfast or after brushing their teeth, and then as well as just um, some the use of medication packaging, so dosettes and blister packs. Thank you, and I'm going to echo Rob's thanks in your presentation. So interesting. Um, you uncovered some really interesting results in that, on one hand, individuals, you know, they 
did not like the disruptive nature of the medications that they were taking. You know, they didn't necessarily want to be doing that. But on the other hand, they feared the consequences of not taking the medication. Um, how did individuals with spinal cord injury describe balancing or addressing or maybe even coping is a better word um, with this? Yeah, so I actually really like that you use the word balance um, because we created a whiteboard video from this, which can be found on YouTube, but it's actually called Finding the Balance. So when looking at this, it was participants really talked about having enough medication to cover the pain, but not so much that they weren't able to do the things that were important to them. So in my presentation, I gave in the, the example of one participant who was taking medication for his pain, but then he was constantly falling asleep during physical therapy. And this was something that was really important to him. So he was trying to work with his healthcare provider to find a dose that covered the pain, but not so much that he wasn't able to participate in his physical therapy. And then some other ways that participants um, tried to find a balance were some alternatives to medications. So sometimes these were things like um, exercise, aqua therapy, heat therapy, but it could also be um, drugs or alcohol were often used as well. And then there were also a significant number of participants who tried to use distraction as a coping mechanism. So staying socially involved with family, friends, um, making sure they were doing their volunteer activities, things of that nature. Thank you, Lauren. Um, I'd like to come back maybe to something that you mentioned uh, in, your, in the first question that I asked. You said that access to care may be a factor that uh, motivates self-management. So thinking about access to care and delivery of care, we're both in the faculty of pharmacy. I wonder if you could elaborate a bit more on the role of the pharmacist in supporting medication management for individuals with spinal cord injury. Yeah, so pharmacists can definitely play a huge role in medication management for people with spinal cord injury. And actually the majority of our participants talked about um, their pharmacist being the first person they turned to if they had questions about their medications, if they wanted to start something new, that was the first person they turned to. And in most cases, um, the participants had a very trusting and long-term relationship with their pharmacist, which definitely facilitated these positive interactions that they had. Um, but just in terms of the role pharmacists can play, um, they can really help just provide general information about medications, what to expect, side effects, things of that nature, but then they can also help with system navigation. So participants often weren't sure who to ask if they had problems with their medications. So given the accessibility of pharmacists, they can also help facilitate those um, uh, questions that people have. Thank you so much, Lauren. And you're absolutely right, touching on the accessibility factor. And it's so nice to, to kind of hear you share that in your research that there were really positive relationships between community pharmacists and these individuals um, in terms of managing their chronic pain medications. That's, that's wonderful to hear. Uh, thank you so much for sharing about your work. I'm really excited to hear what comes next as you begin your PhD. Um, and now we're looking at Franklin. Franklin, it's coming over to you. Um, we have an opportunity to learn more about what you're doing within the Faculty of Nursing. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for kindly taking the time to attend this talk. My name is Franklin. Today, I will outline my research journey, in my developing research area. I belong to the Faculty of nursing under the supervision of Dr. Craig Dale. In terms of research area, I'm in the Dale lab and my research area is pain and liver disease. The focus of today's topic will be on the multidimensional experience of pain in adults with advanced liver disease. My research journey stems from both my professional and personal experience and I'll, I'll, I'll outline them as such. In my nursing education, I have repeatedly encountered the topic of pain. In my undergraduate program, I observed pain to be the most common symptom to affect people from community 
to acute hospitalization. In my master's studies, I focus on models of care to explore the efficacy of various healthcare delivery systems. Therein, I noticed that pain was the most common reason for people to seek healthcare services. In my clinical work, currently, I work as a registered nurse in the operating room at Toronto General Hospital with a subspecialty in solid organ transplantation. In my practice, I wondered about the multitude of symptoms that patients with liver failure go through. In my observations, pain continued to be a common symptom. With respect to my teaching practice, I've been fortunate enough to be a TA and a lecturer in undergraduate and master's programs. Undergraduate and graduate nursing students frequently introduce pain as discussion points in class. With respect to my personal experience, concurrent to my nursing education and work experience, I've had a family member experience pain throughout their 10 year transplant journey. Their pain experience negatively affected their physical movement and capacity to complete activities of daily living, attend school and work, and engage in social activities. These collective experiences have contributed to my research focus on pain. As, we, as I overview my research area, I chose nursing at U of T because of the pain expertise of my supervisor and the experts that could help me explore the, top, explore the topic of pain and liver disease in more depth. Currently, I'm in my final year of the PhD program. I learn how to systematically define a problem, develop research methods to study that problem, and I'm learning how to communicate our findings to many different audiences, such as scholars, clinicians, and patients. With respect to outlining the background problem, adults diagnosed with advanced liver disease experience progressive deterioration of the liver, leading to metabolic derangements, organ failure, and eventually death. In Canada, the Canadian Liver Foundation estimates that approximately 3 million have liver disease. The vast majority of patients do not qualify for liver transplantation and are therefore designated as palliative. Significant musculoskeletal impacts from the abdominal distension and other bodily changes that can precipitate pain. However, clinicians frequently hesit hesitant, hesitate to prescribe analgesia due to organ dysfunction. So then why study this? Well, not much is known about pain in this population. Here's what we know. First and foremost, pain is a human right. Based on our research, we learned that pain characteristics are not well understood in patients with liver disease, whether in Canada or elsewhere in other countries. Having a limited understanding of the person's pain means that we have a limited ability to develop ways to address their pain experience. For example, little is known about what patients actually do when they are in pain at home. Safe medication dosing is a concern for pain management for these patients. The overall objective of our study is to examine pain from a multidimensional perspective for patients with advanced liver disease. This means that we will try to identify pain attributes from the lens of physical, psychological, and sociocultural factors, otherwise known as the biopsychosocial model of pain, which is important for identifying treatments that include but are not limited to medications. To help achieve our objective, we use a convergent parallel mix methods design involving both quantitative and qualitative research methods to help us understand pain in as close to how the patient experiences pain as possible. In terms of data, we have completed data collection and we are currently in data analysis. Our data includes 118 participants with advanced liver disease who completed a 29 item survey and 15 participants who volunteered to a 30 to 60 minute semi-structured interview. Our preliminary findings suggest that patients with advanced liver disease do experience pain as a multidimensional construct. Quantitative and qualitative data supports physical, psychological, and sociocultural domains of pain are apparent in these participants. The 118 participants reported a daily average pain intensity score of 4 out of 10. And 6 out of 10 pain intensity score in the last 24 hours of having completed the survey at the time of data collection. We also found that patients do not have much options for pain management. This may explain that 67% of the participants reported 0% relief from the current pain treatments available to them. We are currently investigating the data 
for physical, psychological, and sociocultural factors that can help explain pain intensity using regression models. Our preliminary analysis suggests liver disease severity, presence of ascites, and edema may explain pain intensity. The impact of our study is its novelty. It is the first Canadian research study exploring the multidimensional pain experience of patients with advanced liver disease. This means this study provides the building block to a multi-site study to explore patients outside of our setting. Our study findings from the quantitative approach can help identify factors that explain pain intensity. This can lead to targeted future interventional studies and development of holistic pain management guidelines. So then what's next? As I mentioned previously, my motivation for this emerging research program is to help people like my family member. I am excited that we can raise awareness to the importance of understanding pain as a multidimensional construct. But more importantly, it is my hope that I can continue to study these patients across Canada so we can map out what pain actually looks like and develop targeted holistic pain interventions to help people like my family member. Now, I feel blessed to have had the opportunity to study here at U of T. I made and continue to make great connections with field experts to help develop this emerging research program. For instance, the University of Toronto Center for the Study of Pain provided me with a specific training focused on pain science that helped me frame and define pain as a tangible problem. My supervisor and research committee helped me translate my ideas into actionable deliverables. The Lawrence Bloomberg Faculty of Nursing holds monthly rounds that are very helpful to see how professors have established their research programs and help their patients of interest. Overall, I'm grateful for the education at U of T. Thank you very much for your time. Again, my name is Franklin from Nursing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Franklin. It is so clear how your research interest is driven by your clinical interest and experience. And so you mentioned in your talk that pain care or pain management is a human right. Can you explain that to me a little bit? Can you touch on what you mean by this, how it impacts the way that you approach your research and maybe even also your clinical practice? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to be speaking with my fellow students about pain. Uh, secondly, pain management as a human right, to me, suggests that as a society, we should collectively explore uh, established and innovative ways to addressing the unique needs of persons who are experiencing pain. So I believe we should do everything we can to understand, acknowledge, and provide access to pain management to improve the quality of life for those that are experiencing pain. Now, this perspective motivates me to explore pain in research and my nursing practice to understand how do patients experience pain. Trying to keep an open mind and explore this experience, trying to understand patient pain experiences I can explain with my own knowledge, and more importantly, trying to find explanations for pain experiences that I'm not familiar with, but are real to the patient. I believe keeping an open mind can help us deepen our knowledge about pain, and perhaps the more we can study and learn about different pain experiences, the more information we can use to help develop pain treatments that can enhance the current approaches and therefore can help us provide targeted pain treatment options. Thank you, Franklin. Actually, I want to touch on another aspect of your talk. You mentioned that pain is a multidimensional experience. Can you expand on that a little bit? What are these different dimensions and factors, and how do these actually influence or inform the pain experience? Uh, firstly, I'd like to credit um, the Turk and Gatchel's work. Um, that's is the lens that uh, that, uh, that we used in terms of our study. So a multidimensional construct, uh, it's a way to understand pain from a multitude of perspectives. And in this, in this particular case, we're looking at it from a um, biopsychosocial view. So there's the physical self that looks at things such as, for instance, um, visceral pain, where there is physiological engagement. Um, it also involves a psychological domain that, that, that involves, for instance, affective uh, areas such as depression and anxiety, looking at the unique pain experience of each person. And, and thirdly, the sociocultural um, domain looks at things such as social support, cultural beliefs. Uh, it looks at external influences of the patient in terms of their ability to perceive pain. Now, this means that all of these domains are in constant interaction with each other. In our study, our preliminary data suggests that pain is multidimensional and that the three domains are present in our study participants. Now, I believe that as a wish for the future, it will be important to understand how the three domains interact with each other. 
More importantly, when we develop um, pain management approaches from clinical assessments to pain treatments, that we consider the three domains because I think these will be very helpful to truly understand the patient's experience. Thank you, Franklin. All right, I have the, the last question for you for this round. Um, you mentioned, you know, you're a practicing clinician. Uh, you mentioned how your own professional education and your clinical observations really shaped your research interests in pain, which I think is, is so important and fascinating. And really, you, you expressed how seeing people with liver disease struggle um, with pain really motivated you to learn more about their pain experiences. Um, how do you find your research findings now influencing, or do you find that your research findings now influence your understanding as a practicing clinician? Is, is this a full circle? Yeah, um, thank you for that question. So I think um, I, um, I, I'm going to answer this from a clinician perspective. So as a clinician, I think an important key learning for me is the importance of collaboration. I think if we're trying to try to understand the patient's experience from this multidimensional um, perspective, then we need to be able to seek help from those that can understand each of the domains. Um, additionally, um, I think our research help, helps me continue to appreciate that engaging in conversation with patients allows me to try understand how each of these domains can interact with another domain. For example, um, what, if, what if a patient is experiencing physical pain but they don't have the social support to help manage their pain or navigate the healthcare system or even take them to see a doctor. I'm learning that these three domains are becoming more and more apparent as I pay attention to it. And I think that they're, they are starting to affect each other the more that I learn about it. That's great. Thank you very much, Franklin. Uh, next up, we have Georgia, and we look forward to learning more about uh, your research in the Faculty of Dentistry. Hi, I'm Georgia Hadges. I'm a student at the Faculty of Dentistry under the supervision of Dr. Massimo Moyetti. My research lies at the intersection of neuroscience and pain, where I want to know, how does pain impact daily tasks? I'm a part-time actress who finds myself in my third year of a PhD program in the field of pain. How did I get here? I started my research journey in my fourth year of my undergraduate studies, when I was studying the brain and behavior, and I was also interested in becoming a dentist. I took a seminar that explored different paths in dentistry, including research, and the lecture that grabbed my attention was Dr. Moyetti's lecture, linking pain to the study of the brain and behavior. I then became a research assistant in his lab to gain experience in the topic, and then I signed on to pursue a PhD because I liked it so much. Have you ever experienced pain while trying to meet an important deadline? Did it make it easier or harder? Pain is a universal experience. We all know what it's like to get hurt. Pain is the leading cause of disability and healthcare costs in Canada, and 20% of Canadians suffer from pain. For some, pain impacts their ability to focus and make decisions, as well as their memory and attention. And these processes together can be thought of under the umbrella term of cognition. Others, however, are able to work through the pain and can be even more productive than usual. How then does pain impact our daily tasks? One idea is that pain is an inherently attention-grabbing or salient alarm signal that shifts our attention away from ongoing tasks and onto the sensory and emotional aspects of the pain experience. It is thought that the option that is more salient between the task or the pain will be prioritized. Think of it as a seesaw with competing weights. If the salience of pain is higher than the salience of the task, then more attention will be paid to the pain than to the task. This idea, however, ignores the fact that pain has an inherent value. There is a motivation to avoid or escape pain because failing to do so could lead to injury or even death. Think of the value of pain as an amount of money that your brain assigns to pain. We also assign a value to the tasks we perform in daily life, like meeting important deadlines. If the value of pain is higher than the value you've assigned to your daily tasks, also shown in this seesaw, it's likely that pain will impact your ability to perform well on those tasks. If you have a very important deadline, and there's a high motivation to work towards it, pain might not affect you as much. 
My research objective is to determine whether pain impacts daily tasks through its salience or its value or both. I think that the value of pain is what drives its impact on daily tasks, where the extent of its impact really depends on whether it is valued higher or lower than competing daily tasks. In order to test this, we have healthy adult participants perform two cognitive tasks. One is a low value task where they earn five cents for every correct response. And one is a high value task where they earn a dollar for every correct response. Participants switch between these two tasks while they remember their place in each one, also known as multitasking. We all multitask in our daily lives, which makes this task really great to use to test performance on daily tasks. These tasks are performed with and without painful heat to determine whether pain impacts task performance. The way this works is we apply a cream onto the skin of the leg that has the ingredient that makes chili peppers spicy. And this ingredient makes your skin feel tender and sensitive to warm and hot temperatures. We apply a warm temperature over top of this cream using a black thermal probe, which acts similarly to a hot plate and the warmth is detected as painful. This way, we can give heat to participants for a long period of time without any risk of injury. The nice thing also about this cream and heat protocol is that it mimics the types of sensations that chronic pain patients experience. And we can do all of this in healthy adults to understand this physiological process of how pain impacts cognition. To control for the fact that pain is salient and that the salience might impact task performance, Participants also perform these tasks with and without an equally salient but non-painful electric sensation. The way this works is we apply two electrodes along the ankle and administer electrical pulses that feel like your foot does when it falls asleep, where it feels tingly and numb. Due to COVID-19, I have not finished collecting my sample, but my expected outcomes depend on which factor drives the impact of pain on task performance, whether it is salience, value, or both. If pain impacts tasks in a salience-based manner, then both pain, indicated as the flame, and the non-painful salient electric sensation, indicated as the lightning bolt, should both impact task performance to the same extent on all tasks, regardless of how valuable they are. If pain impacts cognition in a value-based manner, the value of pain is likely higher than five cents. So it would impact performance on the low value task, but maybe not on the high value task, since the $1 for every correct response is quite high and could be very, very motivating. I would expect in this scenario that the electric sensation would have no effect because it is not painful and therefore does not have an inherent value. If it is both the value and salience of pain driving its impact on tasks, then both pain and electric sensations will affect the low value task, but not the high value task, because again, it is highly rewarding. My project is investigating the physiological process for how pain impacts daily tasks, which is still unknown. It is very important that we determine this because as we age, our cognition declines, our memory fades, and our ability to focus and make decisions gets worse. The development of pain in an aging population will make cognition even worse, no doubt leading to increased suffering, missed work, and healthcare costs. It is important that we develop interventions that target these issues early on, but we need to know what the physiological process is. If it is the value of pain that drives its impact on daily tasks, this means that everyone assigns a value to pain that will influence how they respond to different types of treatments. We can start to assess what the value of pain is for each patient to predict how they will respond to different treatments. An initial intervention that we can implement into healthcare is a program that teaches people how to reduce their value of pain by reframing how they think about pain. By lowering the value of pain, this should lower how much it impacts people in daily life. This type of intervention alone could eliminate the need for more intensive medical treatments that are expensive and time consuming for both patients and healthcare workers, and could also allow patients who need additional treatments to have more positive outcomes because the value of pain has gone down. I have been fortunate to be involved with the University of Toronto Center for the Study of Pain for several years now. 
I am a recipient of the 2020 to 2021 Payne Scientist Scholarship and have attended their exciting academic and professional development webinars. I also am the editor of a segment of the monthly newsletter where we prepare a summary of a newly published research paper. It's a fantastic way to communicate the exciting new pain research at U of T. Thank you very much for this opportunity and for your attention. Feel free to contact me or my supervisor for more information. Thank you. Thank you very much, Georgia. There's a lot there to consider, uh, particularly the importance of assigning a value to pain. You mentioned that everyone assigns a different value to pain. Can you unpack this a little bit more for us? How will individual differences in assigning value to pain impact potential treatment approaches? Right, yeah, that's a great, great question. Um, so we know that when given the choice between receiving pain versus uh, a reward, people tend to pick different rewards based on their individual value of pain. Uh, we also know that people feel pain uh, in different ways. There are a lot of individual differences in the pain experience. So what might feel like a light touch for one person might be excruciating for someone else. And these individual differences are often associated with attitudes about pain. So some people might have experiences that have made them fear pain more and want to escape it and minimize it no matter what. But then we all know someone who seeks out challenges for their body and is into extreme sports and isn't afraid to take risks and undergo injury. So I think that having those attitudes really shapes your value of pain and shapes how much you care about pain. Um, so people who are more sensitive to pain are more likely to develop chronic pain and identifying who is more likely to have pain uh, using this type of task rather than several questionnaires and MRI scans could really help us pinpoint who might need more care and help mitigate negative outcomes. So using the simple tool as a task or, or the task as a tool uh, that allows us to personalize someone's care would be really great rather than to standardize this one size fits all approach. Thank you for that. I think it's you've tapped into so many different uh, important concepts here around the individual experience of pain and then the individualized management of pain and, and approaches uh, to pain. So important. Um, a question that I was thinking about as you were describing, you know, your research and your research approaches is you discussed how your research interest is really in how pain affects day to day living and day to day tasks. But you're exploring this in a very controlled laboratory environment, of course, um, an experimental setting to understand kind of what's underlying this. But can you describe to us or give us examples of, you know, how this would play out in real life? What is the relationship between assigning value to pain and daily tasks and how this would have an impact in day to day tasks? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I just want to emphasize that the impact of pain on quality of life is not small. Uh, patients really are suffering and many of them don't get to live their life to the fullest. They don't have the, either the career they want or family they want because the pain interferes with their life. So in a day-to-day -day setting, this could look like not sleeping well because your pain is impacting your ability to sleep. Uh, you're tired when you wake up. You're not able to get to work on time, take care of yourself and your family. And this leads to isolation socially and impacts mental and physical health. So this could lead to an exacerbation of pain where your pain just keeps getting worse and you get into this negative cycle. So given that we know there are individual differences in how people experience pain, if you're able to reduce the value of pain without actually affecting the pain itself, you could reduce the impact that it has on people's lives. And in the cases of pain where it's not treatable, we can find tools like cognitive behavioral training to reduce that value of pain and improve quality of life until you know, better treatments are discovered. So um, my goal is to understand whether pain has a value that competes with other tasks. And as you mentioned, it is in a very controlled setting and this is a controlled task um, because we really want to make sure that it's value that's driving this effect of pain on task performance. So the preliminary evidence so far seems like that is the case, uh, but there are a lot of knowledge gaps where we don't really know if that value is malleable. Um, and it's a quite exciting field because there's so many questions to be asked. Um, but ultimately, 
the day-to-day -day impact is in these minute and, and for what we might take for granted tasks. Uh, so hopefully through this research, we can uh, have a meaningful impact on the lives of patients. So I'd like to actually just pivot a little bit to something else that's also had a very large impact on essentially all of our daily lives is COVID-19. And you mentioned this uh, in your talk a little bit. I wonder if you could just share a little bit more about how COVID-19 has actually impacted your ability to do research or your research itself. That's a great question. Um, it's been challenging, but uh, ultimately the break in data collection has forced me to engage with the literature more. So I've had a lot of time to really do a deep dive in my project and, and what's known so far, what's not known. So really engaging with the literature. I've also had to get creative and, and work on other data sets in the lab, um, trying to piece together the data sets to try to understand different questions. Uh, so those analyses are ongoing and, and they've really helped me expand my horizons and think about pain and how it applies to many different contexts. Um, additionally, improving the methods and the analysis that I uh, will do on my current sample. So having that time to really uh, elevate the analysis and come up with some more sophisticated ways of, of parsing out individual differences was a really great use of, of my time and um, helped me better my experiments. Roger, kudos to you. Uh, I think it's something to celebrate when you're able to take what has really put a, uh, you know, a pause and a lot of research here and use it as an opportunity to deepen your understanding and improve your methodology. So good, good on you. Um, thank you so much for sharing your work with us. I'm really excited to see how it evolves as your studies continue. Um, now we're pleased to hear about the work from Prab um, and hear more about what you're doing in the Temerty Faculty of Medicine. So Prab, over to you. Hi, my name is Prab. I'm a second year master's student at the Temerty Faculty of Medicine under the supervision of Dr. Hans Clark at the Department of Anesthesiology and Pain Medicine. And today I'll be giving a brief overview of my research journey into pain medicine at the University of Toronto and my thesis project, which investigates the relationship between medical cannabis use and inflammatory cytokines and chemokines among adult chronic pain patients. My journey into pain research occurred well before my undergraduate studies, and it was kind of a blessing in disguise. Before academia, I was a competitive athlete, but that path was cut short due to an injury that eventually led me to live with chronic pain. After that incident, I stopped playing competitive sports and started my undergraduate at University of Toronto in kinesiology and started getting more involved in patient advocacy for chronic pain. Looking back at it now, it was really through my patient experience of wanting to learn more about my own condition and being curious as to why certain treatments worked while others didn't that drove me into pain research. But there was one thing that really caught my attention in pain research, and that was around 2018 when cannabis just got legalized in Canada. And I remember hearing the media perceive it as a cure-all treatment for every health condition, which I knew wasn't true. But I wanted to learn more about cannabis and if it could help others in pain. So I decided to do my master's at the University of Toronto and I was fortunate enough to be introduced to Dr. Hans Clark from another research mentor of mine. The reason why I decided to work with Dr. Clark's lab was due to his expertise in understanding both the positive and negative aspects of medical cannabis. The reason why I decided to work with Dr. Clark at the University of Toronto was because at the time, U of T was emerging as the leading institution for cannabis research post-legalization, and Dr. Clark and his colleagues were one of several labs that had a cannabis research license from Health Canada, which ultimately allowed them to conduct research in cannabis in patients. In regards to my research, most of us know that chronic pain in Canada is staggering, with one in five Canadians currently suffering from chronic pain. With the recent legalization and increasing social acceptability, cannabis use has been increasing among Canadians. In fact, the 2020 Canadian government's cannabis survey indicated that 14% of Canadians currently use medical cannabis, from which most commonly they use it for managing their pain. Given the increasing number of chronic pain patients using cannabis, there really is a need to understand if it can be a suitable alternative for other pain treatments. And if so, how does cannabis actually work to relieve pain? One potential theory of how cannabis can help provide pain relief is through altering the immune system through limiting inflammation. In many conditions such as knee osteoarthritis and other arthritic conditions, it has been theorized that one potential cause of chronic pain could be due to higher levels of inflammatory immune markers known as cytokines and chemokines, such as interleukin-6, 
or better known as IL-6 and TNF-alpha. There have been some interesting research that shows strong correlations or relationships between higher levels of these inflammatory immune markers and greater pain intensity levels felt by the patient. However, at the current moment, there aren't many studies that look into medical cannabis and its influence over the immune system in humans. And no study today actually characterizes the levels of inflammatory immune blood markers in chronic pain patients using medical cannabis. Therefore, the objectives of our study were threefold. First, to characterize the levels of various inflammatory immune markers in chronic pain patients using medical cannabis. Second, was to examine any potential sex differences in these levels of immune markers. This was important as chronic pain tends to be more prevalent in females, and because historically female patients' sex-based analysis have been neglected in pain-related research. And finally, our last objective was to evaluate the effectiveness of cannabis on various patient symptoms, including pain, appetite, sleep, depression, and anxiety. In total, we included 56 patients from the Toronto General Hospital who had been legally prescribed cannabis and were using cannabis once daily for pain management. During their study visit, we collected patient blood samples, which allowed us to measure over 30 immune markers from the patient's blood and asked patients to report the effectiveness of cannabis for their symptoms. We also collected a sample of cannabis product that patients were consuming, and through collaborating with several scientists from the Leslie Dan Faculty of Pharmacy, we were fortunate enough to access to state-of-the-art laboratory equipment such as the Ultra Performance Liquid Chromatography Mass Spectrometer, or UPLC for short, at one of the various labs at the University of Toronto. And this piece of laboratory equipment was vital as it allowed us to confirm the concentrations and chemical composition of cannabis products that patients were consuming. And with this piece of equipment, we were able to confirm that 70% of patients were using THC products and only 30% of were using CBD products. Our cannabis composition results showed us that 54% of patients were using dried cannabis in its plant form as their main way of consuming cannabis, while 37% were using oil-based cannabis products. In terms of dosing, almost half of the patients were considered low-dose cannabis users as they were consuming one gram or less of cannabis, 38% were also considered moderate cannabis dose users, and 15% were considered high-dose users that were consuming three or more grams of cannabis per day. We also examined the patient-reported effectiveness of cannabis by simply asking patients to answer yes or no on whether cannabis improved their symptoms. Our results show that 96% of patients reported effective pain relief with cannabis, and between 83 and 93% of patients also reported improvements in their nausea, appetite, sleep, anxiety, and depression. Although the data is not shown, approximately 75% of patients also reported a decrease in other pain medications including opioids and antidepressants, since starting to use medical cannabis. And although this is not an exhaustive list of all 30 immune markers, from our analysis, we did not find any significant differences in immune markers between patients that were consuming CBD or THC-based products. However, we did observe a potential sex difference in some immune marker concentrations. For instance, female patients at higher levels of IL-5 and macrophage inflammatory protein 1-alpha, or better known as MIP1-alpha, in comparison to males, which trended towards significance. We also found that females had lower levels of TNF-beta, which also trended towards significance, and significantly lower levels of etotoxin in comparison to males using cannabis, which was quite interesting to see. And we believe the results provided from our study are exciting as they indicate that medical cannabis may be a suitable alternative for some chronic pain patients. We also believe that moving forward with cannabis research and pain medicine will require us to continue our understanding of how cannabis can influence the immune system to provide pain relief. And much of this research will need to come in the form of larger, well-designed randomized controlled trials with longer follow-up periods. And to help achieve some of these answers, we're excited to announce that our team at the University of Toronto Center for the Study of Pain was recently awarded a large grant of $1.5 million from the Canadian government for investigating the effectiveness of medical cannabis use in orthopedic patients with osteoarthritis. But my project wouldn't be what it is without the support from the University of Toronto Center for the Study of Pain. The center provided me and other trainees a rich and extensive network of world-renowned scientists and clinicians that really pushed to promote an environment of interdisciplinary collaboration. For instance, with my project, we were able to collaborate with several members that had expertise in pharmacology, chemistry, sleep medicine, mental health, and cannabis to help design our study and provide insights with our results. 
And it was through the center's network that we were able to access various research, research equipment and infrastructure that uniquely positioned our team to undertake projects to investigate cannabis use for pain management. Finally, on a more individual level, the center provided me and other trainees with extensive funding through its University of Toronto Pain Scientist Scholarship and other conference grants, which provided me the financial support to conduct my research and present it nationally. It also provided me and other trainees with many opportunities to improve our professional development and research skills as an emerging scientist by offering the Toronto Pain School monthly webinars during COVID-19 and journal clubs to discuss exciting new research on various pain topics. In summary, I hope all trainees really take the advantage of the great resources and networks the Centre provides to enrich their graduate experience. I also want to thank my supervisor, Dr. Hans Clark, for his ongoing mentorship and encouragement, as well as the Temerty Faculty of Medicine for their support. And I'll end off by just saying that while we all have different journeys into pain medicine, it's our collective goal at the University of Toronto and the Centre for the Study of Pain to lead innovation and to work together to discover the future of pain. Thank you. Prab, it's so interesting to learn how someone's own personal journey can really lead them to develop a passion and a passion in a specific research area. So thank you for sharing about your work. Um, just touching on this and, and probing a little bit deeper, you shared with us how you have personal experience, lived experience with chronic pain that arose from a, a sports injury. And does or do you feel that having this lived experience has had an impact on how you approach your research? Has it shaped your research methodology or questions? Yeah, I think for sure. Um, when having a life you know, or a personal experience with chronic pain, it definitely, definitely does shape the way I approach my work. Um, first, it just gives me a sense of appreciation for the, the strenuous research process and the work that really goes uh, behind researching pain treatments and but it also allows me to ask certain research questions from a patient's perspective and uh, why this research would be really important for that patient or for someone such as myself. Um, I think, but most importantly, it does try to really force me to think of my research from going in a point of direction towards the community, uh, not just from bench to bedside, but to wider patient community. It really does force me to sometimes act as a bridge between um, academia and advocacy in a way that I always keep my mind on my research and how it can be translated to the community. So not just stopping at the results and the conclusion, but how can it be useful, applicable, accessible, and as well as hopefully leading to a more meaningful changes on the societal and policy level. Thank you. Um, actually, I'd like to build on this a little bit and come back to something you mentioned earlier in your talk. And you said that when cannabis was legalized, it was touted as a cure for everything. And I'd like to just ask, what, you, what do you think is the responsibility of the scientific community to investigate some of these claims, to understand whether cannabis actually can have therapeutic potential, very widespread therapeutic potential? Essentially, I guess what I'm trying to ask is that if people can find a use for it, and if it does work for them, why, would, why should we dig deeper into this issue? Yeah, I, I think that's a, a great question. That's something that really drove me into pain research and cannabis research in a whole. But I think the responsibility of the community to, is to ensure that products being consumed for medicinal purposes are regulated and tested for their desired purposes and patients are getting what they're hoping to get from that product. I think it's also our responsibility to both communicate the positives as well as the negative aspects of cannabis to patients, as well as to ensure that they're educated, that it may not work for everyone and that we're still trying to figure out why that may be. Um, and to answer the second part, I think we really need to dive deeper into cannabis research by conducting well-designed clinical trials that help limit some of these biases that we see in other studies um, to essentially just advise patients on the safety purposes of cannabis and how to use it. And just with any other medication, we need to do more research on to determine the optimal therapeutic dose and the optimal concentrations of THC or CBD. And, as these values could be different for different pain conditions. Thank you. You raised some really important points there. And I think building on that are something else that is, is understudied and, and needs to be looked at a little bit more closely. And you mentioned this in your talk, um, are sex differences in this experience. Um, sex differences, that's definitely an area of research that is of interest to me. Um, and you shared some interesting findings in your result, but can you expand a little bit more on the importance of understanding sex differences in chronic pain research? So when it comes to the use of cannabis for the management of chronic pain, 
basically my question, I guess, is uh, does sex matter? And if so, why? Yeah, I think that's a great question, a really important one to uh, discuss. Um, we know that pain is experienced differently between sexes, not only in terms of you know, bio biology, or but also in terms of emotional and psychological experiences of pain. Um, I think it's important to answer these questions in terms of sex differences to see if men and women respond differently to different pain treatments. And if they do, how do we tailor that accordingly? And if there are other adverse events that could occur more often with one sex compared to another sex undergoing a treatment. I think these are really important questions to ask to ensure that the patient is getting the best possible care for themselves. And I think sex differences in cannabis is extremely important. I think um, we know that men and women consume cannabis differently, but there's also evidence showing that the endocannabinoid system, for example, is varies between sexes, which can explain why cannabis can affect individuals differently. But I think it's also important to mention that Males and females typically have different body mass indexes. They have different muscle to fat ratios, uh, hormone levels, liver enzymes, which can also affect the pharmacokinetics, the how um, cannabis is metabolized between sexes, which can lead to different therapeutic effects. And so doing these sex-based analysis, I think it's really important because it just helps the clinician, the patient to make a more informed decision on the appropriate dosing and the risk and benefits of cannabis. Thank you, Georgia, Lauren, Franklin, and Prav for that informative and engaging discussion. Now we're going to move on to some questions that have been submitted by the audience for us today. And we'll try our best to get to as many questions as we can in the time that we have to give. As the questions have come in, I see that there's a number of questions expressing considerable interest in both pharmacological and non-pharmacological approaches for the treatment of pain. Um, just as a disclaimer, I suppose at this point that the speakers that we have here are research trainees and they're unable to offer, unfortunately, specific treatment advice for their ailments. Um, although, as we have heard today, they have offered multiple suggestions and advice for how some of their patients or in their experience, how people have been able to engage with members of the healthcare community. But these questions do make an excellent starting point for our discussion. So there's the increasing interest in non-pharmacological treatments for chronic pain is being driven in part from the many potential negative side effects of some pharmacological treatments, such as opioid dependence or gastrointestinal injury with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. On the other hand, there's emerging evidence that non-pharmacological approaches can have considerable benefits from treatment of chronic pain. So I think that this speaks to the need for comprehensive approaches for the treatment of pain. And can I ask you to comment on how you see promising new treatments emerging from interprofessional or interdisciplinary interaction? Maybe, uh, Lauren, if I could ask you to um, start uh, the discussion. Yeah, sure. So looking at non-pharmacological alternatives was definitely something that was very important to people with spinal cord injury. And we saw that a lot of people wanted um, things like acupuncture, physical therapy, massage, but in many um, cases, these things weren't funded. So when people were, um, you know, maybe had lost their job, unable to work, they may not have actually been an option. So really pharmacological therapies were the only option um, for people with spinal cord injury that we talked to. Um, so one of the key findings from our study was actually to further explore the accessibility of alternatives to um, medications for pain management in adults with spinal cord injury. Thank you. And maybe if I could ask, um, Prof, so in your research into cannabis, there's obviously a lot of different, you mentioned clinicians working together, basic scientists to develop new treatments. Um, could I perhaps maybe direct a question as well to you about how you see this type of collaborative interaction really advancing the field of pain therapeutics and maybe developing new potential treatments? Yeah, I think that's really important. I think, uh, I think cannabis is going to be a lot of research to see how it really interacts with different medications, different therapies, and how patients can really work collaboratively with their physicians and their clinicians in terms of finding the optimal strategy for managing their pain. I think we're kind of far from knowing that cannabis can really be the primary modality of pain management, but I think it will be complementary to many other therapies, as you know, Lauren mentioned, with physical therapy, acupuncture as well. So kind of having a more multimodal strategy, and cannabis could play a role in being one of those as well.
Thank you very much. Um, Georgia or Franklin, I wonder, do you have, from your experience and from your research, how you have seen sort of interprofessional or inter, um, uh, interdisciplinary interaction really kind of driving some of the questions that have uh, driven your research? Yeah, um, I would say my research project is an intersection of cognition and, and pain. So thinking a lot about the psychological factors that impact the pain experience. And we talk a little bit about the biopsychosocial model. So I am focusing more so on that psychological aspect, which really does have uh, such a strong um, impact on, on daily life. And it really does snowball. Uh, all of these processes are linked. So uh, I think it's an interesting way to, to look at treatments where you can think about perhaps a psychological uh, approach. I'm going to jump in here because that's a perfect segue into the next question that we're getting um, from the audience here. And I'm going to I'm going to pick on Franklin. So get ready, Franklin, um, because the next question is really about a deeper understanding of this multi dimensions that you're talking about. So, Georgia, you just mentioned the psychological component and how that's so important and looking at psych psychological approaches to management of pain. And so the audience member really wants to know more about these psychological approaches to pain management. So the question that we're going to pose here is what does this mean um, for approaches to pain management? So put a different way, how has the understanding, our understanding of pain and what, what factors contribute to pain, biological, psychological, social factors, how has this informed pain management? So Franklin, from your experience, both in research and as a clinician, how, do, how has this informed pain management? I think from, uh, thank you very much for this question. Um, I think from, um, from our study perspective, um, firstly, I think um, our population that we looked at um, uh, really uh, suggested that they wanted something a little bit more than medication. And I think it's important to note that medication is very important, the pharmacological sense. And I think it is very effective and has been effective. However, I think for, for conditions like the population that I'm look, that we're looking at in terms of liver disease, it's limited in terms of what they can and they cannot um, be prescribed. So I think a lot of our patients are really looking into, um, are there other ways in terms of, um, other ways for us to be able to deal with pain. So I think um, I think the importance of um, uh, looking at um, uh, both pharmacological and non-pharmacological is is the fact that where do they land in terms of each patient? Well, what I felt, what we found in our participants is that each participant seemed to have a sort of um, a unique story in a unique way of um, of expressing their pain. When when they produced their quantitative um, surveys, they you know we, we, they were able to just, uh, provide us with a particular number. But when they when we started interviewing them, they started to reveal a little bit more in terms of their dimensions and their unique needs. And I think um, I think my colleague uh, Lauren here um, mentioned it earlier in terms of um, you know the idea of resource for instance some patients perhaps uh, may not necessarily be able to um, have access to non-pharmacological treatments so I, I think it's important that that, um, that we that we appreciate that while pharmacological is very important the non-pharmacological piece is something that we should continue to explore and as a clinician I, I I'll tell you that um, uh, patients say they do have medication, but the concern would be things access to um, community access to the non-pharmacological areas. And a lot of these really are, um, and at least in my experience, are privately, um, privately funded. Yes, thank you. Um, that's a really important point. And I think it also kind of taps into on the clinical side of things, um, you know, if, if these non-pharmacological or this more holistic approach to pain management is so important, then who, you know, who is in the clinical team? And so just touching um, on that here, we have this beautiful panel um, of different disciplines all tackling pain. And so then you can begin to get an appreciation and, and Franklin in your clinical experience and in others in research, you know, what's the importance of an interdisciplinary clinical approach to pain management? What does that look like? How do you get trained to do that? I don't know, Prab, if you want to tackle that from maybe the medical side, who do you bring into the team um, in terms of research, 
um, and maybe Franklin in terms of clinical practice uh, to bring this more, more holistic view? Yeah, um, I think when it comes to the research side, like having more individuals from different perspectives does help care for the patient uh, entirely as a whole. And I think as many of our colleagues mentioned, your pain is experienced emotionally, psychologically, and physically as well. And so having a diverse group of interprofessional teams does help manage the pain of that patient more optimally. And I think it does provide benefit to the patient for treating their pain holistically and, and really trying to uh, target pain from many different perspectives. I think also, thank you, Prab, for um, mentioning that. Um, I think um, the other thing that I, I was thinking about is that perhaps um, we should also consider in terms of from an interprofessional perspective is also considering perhaps um, we need experts from, from our community that they may not necessarily be um, a, a particular clinician or um, uh, in my case, a nurse or a physician, but sometimes a lot of these patients look at navigation really trying to find out who the, where to go in terms of service, who to call, um, who to report their, their symptoms to. Um, and in terms of funding mechanism, trying to figure out, do they have access to, uh, to uh, resources to be able to, um, for instance, um, if they wanted to go to the doctor, for instance, and they didn't have a way of getting there, is there, is there a mechanism out there in the community that's um, publicly funded that they can access? So I think, I think exploring also um, for partnership outside of the traditional um, healthcare model, such as a navigator, may be helpful in terms of um, uh, supporting them in terms of their, their holistic, uh, holistic um, uh, uh, perspective, I guess, and how they experience pain. Actually, that's, I think, a really good point to jump into another question that we've seen pop up a couple of times um, about the experience of pain. And the question, uh, the one that I'll read says, I've been told by people I know and even by doctors that my pain is all in my head. Is this true? Um, effectively, this expression, the pain is all in your head or you're just imagining it, is unfortunately sometimes used to dismiss people's experience of pain uh, in a way to diminish their ongoing experience or possibly to deem it as fake. So I'd like to pose the question uh, to the trainees here that um, is all pain real? And maybe if you could comment a little bit on the brain's role and the experience of pain. And I think I'll start uh, this with Georgia. That's a really, really good question. Uh, so I would start off by saying that a, a patient's experience should be respected and listened to. Um, I think it's hard to tell someone, no, you don't feel what you're feeling. Um, but at the same time, so much of how we perceive pain or say a noxious, uh, stimulus, which is to say a stimulus that could lead to potential tissue damage, um, is, is definitely influenced by your prior beliefs and, and how much attention you're paying to it. So it is a balance between the two, I would say. Um, and it's, it's hard to tackle that, I would say. In your, I guess if I could just uh, have maybe a bit of a follow-up specifically with your study. Um, so when you were using experimental approaches, I suppose, um, to modify the experience of pain or find things that can modify the experience of pain, how does that, this type of experimental research sort of, uh, inform our understanding of pain being an experience, pain being a unique individual uh, aspect to it. And, you know, even to address this question of whether pain is in someone's head. Right. I think going back to the individual differences, you can see that some people, uh, it really depends on context, how much a painful experience is bothering them or that they even pay attention to. Uh, so some people are affected by pain when they do a task, uh, others not at all. Um, and I think that in terms of modulating the, the pain experience, in terms of value, a really good question would be if we were to modify value of pain or value of a task, how does that impact um, a person's perception? You know, I think I'd actually like to maybe shift gears and kind of 
flip that question or also around a little bit. Um, in terms of pain being all in someone's head, we know that this isn't the case. Pain is an experience. On the other hand, we do have that the psychological state, you know, the overall experience of the individual can also impact sort of their perception of pain as well. This can be affected, of course, by social factors, as, as we've been discussing, but as well by therapies, drugs that individuals are using. And I think this is particularly relevant, uh, let's say, in the case of cannabis, maybe perhaps, which does have well-documented psychological effects. Um, so maybe if we could try and turn it around the other way, and we think about cannabis as treating pain, but uh, maybe probably if you could comment a little bit more on what's been studied or known about you know, the psychological aspects of pain may be also having beneficial effect of uh, cannabis, sorry, also having um, some influence on the experience of pain. Yeah, um, I think that's a great question. Um, I think cannabis does play a role definitely on the perception of pain, on the, the cognitive factors related to pain as well. But the uh, psychological aspects have been pretty well studied with it. We all know that THC is the main ingredient in, tea, uh, in cannabis that does cause some psychological effects in terms of. Um, uh, the perception of pain, but not so much as CBD. And I think there's studies that have shown that, that uh, cannabis does help with sometimes the mental aspects of pain that are associated with chronic pain, such as anxiety or any other mental health uh, issues that arise as well with it. Um, there's, there's also some studies that have shown that cannabis can help uh, with the perception of pain in terms of reducing the intensity of pain and how patients uh, experience pain overall. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, one other aspect, and I think it's it's related to this idea, you know, some patients experience or individuals with pain experience um, this um, mistrust and it's, it's all in your head and these really distressing comments. But another one is that pain is often invisible. And so it's really hard um, to, to prove that you're in pain at individuals. So the next question, that I, I have for the group and anybody can answer is, do you have to see or find the cause of tissue damage for it to be considered a diagnosis of chronic pain? Is Does every chronic pain have um, associated tissue damage with it? Um, so why don't we start there and then we can move along to another question. Um, and maybe I'll, uh, I'll ask uh, Lauren to start and then we can go to somebody else and get their thoughts. Yeah, so I think it's important. Um, I'm going to echo what Georgia said earlier, not to dismiss patients' experiences, because as clinicians, as healthcare providers, um, I think it's important to consider everyone's experiences as they describe them. And at least with spinal cord injury, I don't think that there has to necessarily be tissue jam damage to experience pain. Um, but with that being said, I do, there are multiple different types of pain that people experience, each with um, their own impacts, how they impact them psychologically, socially, as we've been discussing. So I do think it's important to consider everyone's experiences as they describe them in order to help um, find the best possible management for them based on their preferences and their desires and their beliefs. Thank you, Lauren. Um, can I, to add on to that, I think, um, you know, it is very difficult, even um, if we look at diagnosis, for instance, um, in things that you can't see, um, um, certain, certain diagnosis, for instance, at least in the liver world, you don't physically see um, conditions, whereas another diagnosis, could show, you can show ascites. Right. And um, in our study, for instance, um, patients that, um, for instance, that report ascites and those that don't report ascites um, will rate the pain similarly, because sometimes that what they experience is perhaps hidden behind the clothing or perhaps it's hidden behind the tissues or perhaps um, it, it's things that people have told them you're not experiencing pain and may, maybe our study was an outlet for them. So I think the challenge, I think, for clinicians is because the way you know, I know for me, at least in nursing school, um, when, 
when we learn about pain, you learn about pain for patients that are aching, that are patients that are vocalizing it. But what's not necessarily taught well, um, I think in my experience uh, um, back in the day, um, is that um, there's patients that perhaps may not necessarily communicate that. Right. Um, so I know for, for, for me, in my personal experience, I have a family member that experiences pain, but he's not very vocal. So he he just stays quiet, for instance. So as a clinician, you may not, if you, if the patients will continue to say, Oh, I don't have pain, they may actually have pain. But the challenge is how does a clinician be able to manage that workload and time and try to manage all other patients? Uh, whereas this, uh, whereas the one patient, you need a little bit more time to dedicate to them. So, um, I, I think it's a it's a very very um, valid question. I think it's a very hard question because um you know pain it, pain is the experience of the patient um, and it's very difficult to um to say they don't have pain. It, it you know it's 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 such a it's a good question and I think it's something that I think a lot of clinicians and 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 for me at least as a trainee that I struggle with. Thank you. Thank you so much. That raises a lot of really important question, uh, points because I was going to kind of wrap that question and answer up with, you know, pain is whatever the patient says it is. But you brought up the really important point about patients can't always express what their pain is and they can't always communicate what their pain is. So on the clinical side, recognizing that and then on the research side, using and developing diagnostic tools to better aid our understanding and our diagnosis of pain. So those complementary approaches. Um, we're near during the wrap up time, and I really want to get to this question, so I'm just going to jump right in um, because it really struck me, Prab, when you shared at the end of your talk, you mentioned how the UTCSP community, um, how everybody takes different journeys. And everybody here, we've got a huge broad community um, using different techniques different approaches, expertise, um, but that it's our collective goal to lead innovation and work together to discover more about pain mechanisms and management. Um, so the question that I'm going to end this session with, um, for all of you are, what are your next steps in this journey? What excites you about this? How do you intend to use the opportunities and training that you've received at U of T uh, to support these next goals along your journey? So why don't we have Georgia go first and we'll get a chance to hear from all of you. Thank you so much for that question. Um, there's a lot to be excited about. Uh, I think for me, answering the other questions that I'm really interested in in terms of my project would be really great. Uh, I'm very passionate about science communication and I love this event, especially because it's a really great way to develop those skills uh, and continuing to do so in whatever I do next. Uh, I would love to, um, to, to go that route. And uh, just continuing to learn a lot more about, about pain and pain management is really, really important and exciting. Thank you so much. Prab, how about you? What are your next steps? Yeah, um, that's a good question. Um, I'm still trying to figure that out, but I think my, uh, my next steps are to continue advocating for patients uh, to gain more clinical knowledge in pain medicine while shifting from a trainee role into a more independent researcher in my coming years. Um, I think my next steps would also serve to explore and find my niche in pain research, which I hope could be something related to chronic pain and the athletic population. Um, I, I tend to use what I learned from the University of Toronto Center for the Study of Pain and my graduate experience to pay it forward to by mentoring uh, other younger trainees, not only to help them grow, but to also apply my own professional development skills that I've gained. And uh, just not from UFT, but my supervisor to improve my skills as a principal investigator in the future. And I think lastly, it's one of my goals in my pain research journey would be to use my platform to help increase diversity in all its forms in pain sciences, as well as to get more individuals with lived experience involved in pain research, because I, I truly do believe that there is a lot of benefit to having uh, patients as partners in research. Thank you so much. It's so exciting to hear about those big goals. And it's always wonderful when people are bringing their passions to their research. Uh, Lauren, how about you? What's next for you? Yeah, so as I mentioned, I'm planning to start my PhD journey in the fall. So right now, that's the biggest thing that I'm looking forward to that's really exciting me. Um, 
And just in terms of pain research, I think building off my master's work where we really identified the issue and the challenges that people are experiencing, and now flipping it to figure out what we can actually do to improve those experiences and improve pain management and just overall self-management as a whole. So yeah, I'm really excited to start this journey and I, I'm sure as, as things go on, there'll be more things that come along that um, questions that we're able to answer. And I'm really excited to start this endeavor. Awesome, and best of luck as you start your PhD and continue your great work. Um, Franklin, over, we'll end with you. What's next for you? Oh, we're just gonna get you to unmute yourself there, Franklin. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we're in the final phases of our um, data analysis. And I think what's exciting for me is that um, we collected our data from a single site. And um, I'm really interested to see what other patients outside of our site um, experience. And hopefully, um, you know, uh, we can study other patients outside of that and see what we learned from the single site and to see if other patients that's got liver disease, do they experience a similar pain? Um, you know, the other thing that we're also looking at is that what do they actually do when they are in pain, right? In our study site, about 67% of our population suggested that um, um, they have 0% relief in terms of pain um, of whatever pain treatments it is that they have. So it'd be interesting to see what do the other um, uh, other patients experience. And I think I'm excited to see, can we make partnerships? You know, um, once we um, you know, deliver this uh, information to others, um, what do they think about it? You know, so I think I'm excited to uh, expanding the study to see what other patients go through and see if um, we can raise a little bit of awareness that, hey, um, you know, pain, it, it seems to be real in this population. So why don't we work together and see what else we can do for them, so. That's great. Thank you, everyone. It's wonderful to hear your future outlook, looking towards actually translating your research and trying to make a difference in the lives of patients, you know, looking towards the applicability of your research, seeing the hope and, you know, the enthusiasm that you bring to research. And uh, I just want to thank you all again. Thank all of our speakers for joining us tonight. Um, you know, I wish you success in your research going forward. And Again, thank you very much for your insights into your research here at the University of Toronto. And to our audience, I wanna thank everyone for your questions uh, as we wrap up our event. I hope that you're able to leave this evening with a bit more knowledge and understanding about the exciting research happening at the University of Toronto being that of course by our trainees, uh, such as you've seen here tonight. Uh, following this uh, evening's event, all attendees will be sent an email with the links to the recorded version of the event and more information about the University of Toronto Centre for the Study of Pain, as well as a survey uh, for you to please provide feedback. So thank you again for joining us, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening.